Hi guys, welcome to the Overdrive Digital Show. We are live, so you can drop in your auto-related queries in our comment section. We've got Citro C3 hatchback review details about the Scorpio N line Lamborghini Aventador Altime. So feel free to ask us anything about these cars. Oh yes, of course, even the Mercedes AMG GT Black Series. Bert and Rohit will be joining us uh, shortly to answer all your questions live. So as I said, we'll start the show with the Citro C3, which is 98% locally assembled in India, which will enable the brand to price this pretty competitively. Let's see what this car is all about. The Citroën C5 is an imported product, but Citroën's much-awaited made-in-India, made-for-India car is this, the C3. This one too has headlights in the bumper. Halogen only, this C3 hatchback sits on a generous 2.5 meter long wheelbase which makes it appear large and it also has a taller stance than most conventional hatchbacks. Citroën is insisting that this is a hatchback but it has a crossover rivaling 180 millimeters of ground clearance and comparable suspension travel too. And I'm happy to report that the ride quality is actually quite supple even on the C3. Of course, the suspension is pretty basic in its configuration. It's not as fancy as what you have in the C5. However, compared to a lot of low-cost hatchbacks or vehicles in this particular price bracket, the suspension setup is actually quite nice. It doesn't feel rickety. It doesn't feel to have that metallic clunk every time it's going through a series of potholes or through the sharp bumps. It's nice and supple. It feels nice and pliant. It has a premium edge to it. So that's a big win for the C3 as far as the intent or the signature of Citroën is concerned. To demonstrate it better, let's revisit history. Now let's see if the suspension is good enough. For that, a bit of a history lesson. Remember the 1948 2CV? There was a very famous commercial which was in line with the brief given to the engineers of the car. The car has to be able to ply the B roads, the country roads, also drive through a ploughed field while keeping its occupants comfortable and a basket of eggs safe. Can the C3 do that? Let's find out. Okay, not a basket of eggs. It's in an old box that was for disposable masks because we still use them. And there are about a dozen eggs. Let's see how many of these remain safe if we drive over not a ploughed field but bad roads because essentially that is what most of the customers of the C3 are going to drive over. So let's do that at 50 kilometers an hour and see how many of these eggs remain safe. I can hardly feel anything inside the cabin. I can have a regular conversation with you with no change to my voice. I hope my eggs are safe as well. I mean, the basket of eggs. And all the eggs are safe. All the eggs are safe. The Citroën 2 CV shall be proud. Good job, C3. Let's get on with it. Interestingly, this inexpensive suspension isn't too noisy. Where the car does feel a bit clunky though is how the doors, bonnet or boot shut. And since we are nitpicking, the DRLs are LEDs but all other lights in the front and the rear are conventional halogen bulbs. The rear windscreen doesn't get a wash, wipe or defogger even in the range dropping trim. The alloy wheels we showed you in the walk around video are only available as an accessory. There are only two trims to choose from and even on the top end spec, the feature list is pretty short. And on the entry spec, well, it's very bare bones. On the range topper, you only get two parking sensors at the rear. But there is a provision for a reversing camera. There are no rear AC vents but you get two fast charging USB-A ports. There are two ports in the front too. There is wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And while the screen isn't laggy, the audio quality is pretty average from the four-speaker system. 
So this little notch here is for routing the cables, but fat cables don't go through, so it's not working for me right now. And they'll also sell you a cradle to mount your phone right here. It's a part of the 70 plus accessories list. The plastics, they are the scratchy type. They are low rent, of course, but they don't feel low rent. They don't feel bad to the touch or off-putting to the touch. There are no rough edges. Most of the shutter lines are quite consistent, but overall, it doesn't feel too cheap inside. And that's a good thing. The big inlay panel, which can be had in two colors, looks nice and adds a youthful touch. And despite the dark upholstery used in the cabin, the large glass house makes the cabin feel quite roomy, which it indeed is. Citroën says that the seats are placed 100 millimeters higher and the shoulder room is 50 millimeters wider than a conventional hatchback. And that essentially affords it better ingress and egress. The doors are also nice and wide at the front. At the rear, not so wide, but Ingress and egress at the rear isn't a problem either. You can simply just walk into the cabin. In fact, the height of the rear seats is slightly taller than even the front, so that even the rear seat occupants get a good visibility. Let me show you here as well. The window line is actually below my shoulder. So getting a good view out, even for shorter people or even for kids, is not a problem at all. Speaking of kids, this bench is only going to be good enough for two adults and a kid. And that's because you see the integrated headrests only available at both the ends so that's only for two adults for the kids it's going to be a bit of a porch despite the high seating headroom isn't too bad you can see they have nicely scooped out the roof liner anyone who is about six feet is probably going to have a problem especially if the car bounces over a pothole or a speed hump you might end up hitting your head against the roof but honestly otherwise for my height of five feet eight the headroom is not too bad the knee room also quite good and because the front seats are set at a higher position, the foot space is also quite good though you have to be aware of these rails. Thankfully, they have added cladding on top of it. So overall, I quite like the space. Speaking of the boot, I would have liked these threads to be slightly shorter so that the angle of the parcel shelf would have been slightly higher. That would make uh, removing or loading the stuff easier. Now the loading lip is quite high, the boot is quite deep. That essentially means that you have to lift all your luggage while unloading. You can't just simply pull it out. But that's about it. A weekend's worth of luggage for a family of four shouldn't be a problem at all. Speaking of road trips, there are two engine options to choose from. A 1.2 litre engine that can be had with an 82 PS naturally aspirated Avtar or a turbocharged 110 PS tune. Both these engines feed power to the front wheels via 5-speed or 6-speed manual transmission respectively. Now the 1.2 turbocharged engine, it is I think the one to get. That is the one I would choose if I was buying this car. Just because it's a nice engine, there is not a pronounced turbo lag. It gives you power on tap. And I also like the performance of the six-speed manual. Now the clutch lever, it has quite a long travel. However, it's a very nice and light clutch. So it shouldn't get too cumbersome in the city traffic. Now at launch, it only ships with manual transmission options for both the engines. But hopefully going forward, there'll be automatic options added as well. So this is the naturally aspirated petrol that I'm driving right now. Uh, you can also see these grey inlays in here. That's the other option that you get on the cabin. Otherwise, there is not much of a difference in the cabin. Everything remains the same. The gear shifter is different, of course, because this is the 5-speed manual. Uh, the clutch feel, the gear shift quality, all of that remains the same as the turbocharged petrol as well. Where it differs, of course, is because it's naturally aspirated, it's a bit peaky. You have to rev quite a bit to get anywhere. It's a bit sluggish of the mark. So if you are purely looking at an urban runabout, you will not go wrong choosing either of these engines. Even the 82 PS feels quite adequate. In terms of the fuel economy, Citroën says that both these engines are pretty comparable, at least on the claimed efficiency figures. Both of them hover around the 19 to 20 kilometers to a litre mark. I also like the shift quality on this gearbox. It's nice and smooth on the six-speed manual. It doesn't have that rubbery effect, doesn't feel clunky. The shifts are nice and uh, very sure-footed in that sense. And I quite like it. Couple that with the light clutch and shifting is an absolute delight on this car. You only get disc brakes at the front, it's drum brakes at the rear. 
but it's a lightweight car. It comes to a halt very quickly and uh, in a very sure-footed manner. Uh, even high-speed braking is not unnerving at all. The safety kit is pretty basic too, comprising of two airbags, two disc brakes and no Isofix child seat mounts. Of course, with that kind of a ride quality and the high ground clearance that this vehicle has, it does make a bit of a compromise in terms of the handling dynamics. There is an understeer edge to it around tight switchbacks. It does feel that it needs a little bit more effort at the steering from the driver's end. And there is a fair bit of vertical movement as well. But when I say that, I'm comparing it to other hatchbacks like say the Swift, the Bellino, the i20. But if you were to compare it to the Kyger or the Punch, the body roll between these vehicles is quite comparable. So while I said that there is a fair bit of body roll around tight switchbacks, the vehicle never feels unnerving. There's enough grip and even at highway speeds when you're on long straights, the high speed stability is quite good. The only bit that is annoying is the beeper at 120 km an hour, which in this car is quite loud. In a nutshell then, the Citroën C3 has a pretty basic features list which will leave you wanting for more. What works in its favour though are its youthful styling, surprisingly good ride quality for the segment, a roomy cabin and engine options which are above par on the specs and also promise to be quite frugal. All of which should excite those looking for practicality over a long list of features and creature comforts. Right, to sum it up then, it may not be an enthusiast car and that's only down to the handling, otherwise the engine and the specs would suggest otherwise. What I would say is that this is a very friendly city runabout. So irrespective of the engine that you choose, this is going to be the main highlight, the main characteristic of the car. And finally, I hope that Citroën doesn't get too ambitious with the pricing because with the kind of uh, scarce kit that it is offering, I hope that they price it really well. We've seen them being too ambitious with the pricing for the C5 and even for the other group brand, which is Jeep. So we've seen them being quite ambitious with the Meridian and the Compass. I hope they do not repeat the same with the C3. I hope they really, really put this in as a game changer, just the way the compatriots did with the Renault Kyger and the Renault Quid. If they do that, then certainly on the merit of its style, on the merit of its ride quality and on the merit of its overall flamboyance, I think the C3 could be a big winner. Well, the C3 will launch in India on 20th of July and bookings will start from the 1st of July. Let's uh, get bored on the show. We have to wait a while longer for Rohit uh, to join us as well. Hi, Bert. But you're on mute. Hi, can you hear yes. me now? Yes. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Soini. And uh, while you're waiting for Rohit to come on board, I think. Uh, yeah, he's on. Uh, he's on a shoot. He was just uh, dropping off a motorcycle, and he said he'll be there in another ten minutes. He should join us. So, All what right, your so initial impressions? Uh, the C3. Well, I think it looks good, uh, and. Uh, I think it looks interesting. The color combinations, the two-tone effect, you know, that very funky orangish kind of highlights that it's got. Uh, the design as well, quite quirky. But then let's not forget within the segment, uh, most of the designs that are there right now uh, are fairly quirky. You know, uh, whether it's the Punch, whether it's the Tiger, whether it's the Quid, for that matter, the Magnite, you know, everywhere, everything that uh, the C3 would compete against. Uh, they're all very quirky designs, very quirky styling. Um, but yes, uh, I'll give the C3 this much. It stands out, uh, and it's not, uh, you know, something that's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's quite easy on the eye, but it's also fairly attractive. It gets a lot of attention. Uh, so I think that's a good thing for Citroen. Um, it's an interesting business strategy also because they've come in from the C5, which is the 35 lakh rupees. And then now coming down to the C3, which may roughly be about, you know, in that eight lakh bracket, uh, is where I presume the pricing would be at. So I think it's a fairly interesting business proposition for them also to see how they would do. Um, like Rohit mentioned in the video, I think one of the problems and one of the challenges that the C3 is going to face, and which I think a lot of, uh, I would say a lot, but uh, manufacturers like Citroen need to pay heed to, is that India is not a market any longer that wants, uh, you know, low rent, uh, little value products. They want the best of what they can get. 
uh, Indians want Mercedes Benzes and Audis and BMWs at multi 800 prices. Uh, and uh, there are manufacturers offering that. And I think it's uh, Citroen could have taken the lead in this space if rather than trying to target, you know, uh, it is a mass market car, but rather than having to target uh, the absolute, absolute or rather scraping the bottom of the barrel, if they had to kind of make it a little more premium, a little more upmarket in that sense, and of course, uh, maybe charge a little bit of a premium as well, they possibly could have done fairly well uh, with this car. Right now, they're going to have to compete against, like I said, the the, the Kyger, the Magnite, the Punch, and all of these, you know, pseudo crossover SUV kind of things uh, that are in the space. And in that space, you're competing against these giants who've got a far larger network. Citroen's network isn't really that impressive across the country. They're very, very good dealerships. Uh, you know, case in point, I mean, Citroen right now does not even have a dealership in Bombay. The last dealership that was there shut down and has packed up and has left the brand. And they now, of course, we, they will be appointing new dealers for that matter. But, uh, you know, it doesn't really speak very well for the brand and for what they're able to achieve. But for a car of this order, also, they will need a large network, you know, for them to see decent enough numbers. Right now, they're at about, uh, they're, they're hardly anywhere. They're about 30 or 40 dealerships or a little more than that, possibly. And they're adding a few more, about 30 more dealerships. But that, that kind of work, that kind of network isn't really enough to promote a product like the C3 in this country. You need a far larger network. Uh, Zishan says, Bert, that this car looks like the Tata Punch. Do you agree? Uh, well, there are certain similarities that you would see in it, especially in the front end. Like I said, most of them are now in this segment, essentially, are kind of looking the same. Uh, big in-your-face highlights, especially on the front uh, bumper, the headlamps, you know, low position headlamps, things like that. There are, quite, there are quite a few design similarities and there are a few, you know, things that would overlap. I wouldn't say overlap necessarily, but you'd, you'd start finding those similarities. You'd start immediately identifying, saying, oh, this looks similar to this car. No, that looks similar to the other car. But it's very hard in this segment, keep that in mind, to kind of make a revolutionary standout design. It's, it's, it's a challenging aspect because your canvas is that small. Uh, so you can't go too large and too over the top on certain elements. Others, they wouldn't fit the frame and would look completely out of place. Uh, at the same time, like I said, your canvas is small, so there's only so much that you can do with it. But I'm just trying to understand that, uh, you know, Citro has also announced that they're going to uh, launch the C3. <laughs> EV basically in 2023. Now, yes. is this something that, you know, basically the brand is trying to gauge where the car stands, you know, probably they have to try and understand how, you know, how they can fare well in the Indian market as well, which is why there's a lot of cost cutting because they want people to buy these cars, you know, try and get as many eyeballs as possible before the electric car launches in the, uh, in the country as well. But like I said, cost cutting does not necessarily mean or rather reducing, uh, lowering the number of features that you offer, the quality of materials that you use does not necessarily mean that you would sell more cars. Uh, let's not forget today, if you have take, you know, the, the, the biggest volume seller in the market today, which is Maruti. Uh, Maruti's quality, interior quality, quality of plastics, the kind of features, they aren't dull, they aren't, uh, you know, they aren't low rent in that sense. And Maruti also, is quick, you know, has learned that uh, even customers in that segment want everything possible. So... It doesn't. It's not. It's not a sound plan in that sense to kind of cut down on certain features, to cut down on the quality, and say, okay, you know, it's at the lower end of the market, so let's try and see if we can do that. And that consumer doesn't want it. No, it's. It's that's not the case. Consumers, even in this segment, even in the uh, the, the B segment or the A segment for that matter, uh, they want everything and they want the best of everything. So in that sense, uh, it's it's not kind of preparing for the C the C3 EV. Uh, the C3 EV is then has come out, and uh, Citroen will not be able to do much with uh, you know where cost is concerned because uh, it will be expensive, of course. Yeah. Um, and it will be something similar to what uh, Tata Motors has done with the Nexon, where you got the Nexon and you got the Nexon EV in the market, and not much has changed physically with those cars. They still offer exactly the same, you know, uh, the, the the suspension rolling parts are all all the same in that sense. Something is different over there. There are a few design and styling changes on the inside and the outside, but of course, it's a part train that differs between these two. But the Nexon EV is significantly more expensive than the Nexon as well. There is a substantial price hike. So that will apply to the Citroen, uh, the C3 EV as well. So it's not going to change the status of that car or it's not going to change the kind of dynamics that they would want that car to achieve. It will still sell low volumes initially and maybe in another couple of years, think cars like those would then start picking up volume as more and more consumers in this segment you know, going for an electric vehicle. 
Keep in mind, a lot of users in this segment aren't going into electric vehicles at this point in time simply because of the charging infrastructure and inevitability of it. A lot of middle income or lower income groups uh, live in apartment complexes where there are there really isn't a facility to you know put charging stations in place. Uh, accessibility is still not there. There are public charging facilities in uh, infrastructure. So you know these are challenges that even they are aware of, and which is why it doesn't really do well. At the same time, like Maruti said, Mr. Bhargav also very easily said that you know it's not easy even for Maruti to make a low-cost electric vehicle simply because the costs are prohibitive. Uh, it is very difficult to get a battery pack at that size, that at that cost, that could make mass market electrification a reality. Right now, it's still a dream. People are working on it, but. What we clearly seen is that not too many are actually looking at that space. I mean, recently I was reading a report, and even Mercedes Benz, for that matter, says that when electrification happens, certain cars like the A class and the B class, those cars might not exist, may not exist, because uh, you know, uh, cost to what they're offering may just not be justified at this point in time. Yes, ten years from now, fifteen years from now, there might possibly be those segments that will exist, but till then, it'll be very very challenging uh, for electrification to take root in this segment. Okay, uh, Mayur was chatting with Aman, uh, and he mentions that it uh, that design does not matter in this price range. What is the need of a car uh, in this budget is reliability and low running costs and fuel efficiency. Do you agree with that word? Well, uh, yes and no. Definitely, low running costs, fuel efficiency, uh, and reliability are very very crucial in this uh, segment for this for this type of car. But design is also extremely important. Indians are very, very conscious about how things look, what how they look in their cars, how people perceive them to be, and what they want is individuality. Uh, they, they they want to be different from what their neighbors are. They want to be seen as different from what their neighbors are like. And in that sense, design plays a very, very important role. Has can has played an important role in the past and will continue to play a very, very important role in the future as well. Uh, you cannot argue that you know design really doesn't matter. Design is the first and foremost uh, selling point for any vehicle across any segment. Okay, uh, but uh, we'll take some other questions until Rohit joins us. Surat wants to know, is Hyundai Palisade uh, going to launch in India? No, Hyundai Palisade is not coming to India. So is there anything else that you can suggest? Uh, for him? They've got the, the Tucson coming out and that's about the biggest that you will get with the Hyundai range. Uh, because of that, there's been a lot of speculation, Palisade coming, not coming. But uh, anything that has to happen will... I am not entirely sure and confident that the Palisade will come down to India because uh, let's look at it like this. Uh, Hyundai really isn't selling any CBUs in the market at this point in time. They're not too far away from the electrification plans as well. And the Palisade does not fit into that uh, structure at this point in time. So Palisade coming to India, well, it definitely looks like a pipe dream uh, rather than, you know, with uh, having a strong foundation in base in this market. What you, also have to what, you, what you also have to keep in mind, Suraj, is that the Palisade will not be an, will not be a cheap car. It will be positioned, it's positioned significantly above the Tucson or the Santa Fe also for that matter. And, uh, you know, the Palisade's cost, uh, the price that would come at, uh, would essentially mean it would compete against the Audi, BMWs, and Mercedes Benz of the world. And the question mark is then, would a consumer buy a Palisade or an equivalent uh, or at least cost equivalent Mercedes Benz Audi BMW. But he's also mentioned that he wouldn't want to look at a Fortuner and he's thinking about the Gloucester. Well, you have the Gloucester, not a bad option if you're looking for a lot of features and good comfortable drive quality. I'm not very impressed with the engine and performance and you know there are certain issues which I'm hoping uh, don't exist in longer, any longer or to be taken over out of the whole equation. But my recommendation would also then possibly be, I mean, if you're looking for three-seater uh, SUVs, then you've got, uh, there's the XUV, that's one, that's lower than the price order. Uh, you've got the Meriden as well, uh, and that's the second option that you have in the segment that will give you those three-row uh, seating. So those are the only other two options to the fortune at this point in time, unfortunately. I mean, the Endeavor is no longer the market, but you do get a good second-hand Endeavor, used Endeavor. Uh, it might not be a bad option to go into that as well. Okay, here's a uh, issue Satya Seelan seems to be facing. He said uh, he has booked the Hyundai i20 N line in March and allotment is still pending at the vendor's end. There is a delay of two months as to what was promised. What is really happening? Any guesses? 
Okay, so let me put it like this. There are several things that are happening and several factors that are delaying uh, delivery for a lot of customers, for a lot of manufacturers, uh, in, in, in not just in India, across the world, right? Uh, the two factors, the first one, of course, is the semiconductor shortage. There is an acute shortage of semiconductors, and this is, a big, this is an interesting story. Because what happens is in the automotive industry, the semiconductors that are being used and the technology being used in these cars is still about two or three decades behind the technologies that are being used in the smartphone industry and various other electronic uh, goods industry. Okay, I'm talking about purely from the perspective of electronics. Now, what is happening is globally, all of the semiconductor manufacturers have anyways moved towards the new tech, newer technologies and newer standards. And they're now manufacturing that to cater to the uh, automotive industry. They actually have to step back where the processes are concerned and go and manufacture two year or three year old technologies. And not many of them are willing to do that post pandemic simply because there is just such a huge demand for smartphones, other electronic devices, there is laptops, tablets, uh, so many other things that are that are coming out in terms of electronics. And there is a huge demand for semiconductors in that segment, in those with those segments. So it really doesn't make this. And this came from a manufacturer, semiconductor manufacturer in India as well, who essentially said we are not in a position to deliver anything to the Indian automotive industry because simply because what they require is two, three years old, uh, and not something that is current. If they were current, they would probably this delay wouldn't occur. Uh, things would be a little more sorted. But it's just difficult for you to go back and then manufacture that is something so old. Go back into that process. Nobody really wants to do that until and unless the automotive industry uh, amps up what they are doing in terms of technology and offers state of the art or at least the latest latest technology in their cars. Till then, well, it's not going to help. So conductors are going to be an issue. That's one factor that's delaying uh, the delivery of your car. The second factor, of course, is this global supply chain issue. Now, keep in mind, before or rather during the pandemic, the pandemic, of course, locked down everything across the world. So parts are not being manufactured, factories had to shut down. Uh, there's a supply chain issue, which means that parts that were later made, they could not, you know, really go out, not be transported across the world. Uh, then compounding that issue was also the, the jam at the Suez Canal, where that one ship, you know, kind of held back a lot of containers. Uh, that, that supply chain has piled up. And effectively, what we are seeing now is a significant delay in the supply chain process, over and above which there was a container shortage across the world, which means containers across the world uh, were being auctioned off for nearly five to six times what their actual price uh, was to lease out these containers. And that has led to another shortage. Manufacturers don't see the feasibility or don't see it being as a, as a, a solution uh, that they can work on. Uh, it just means it's too much of money being spent on containers to ship various things across the world. So these two are the biggest issues. Keep in mind also consistently there have been lockdowns, there have been other, there have been other tragedies, other issues. Uh, there's a plant in Taiwan that caught fire and semiconductors were, that has delayed everything by a significant amount of time. So all of these factors have been piling up over the last two years. And this essentially is leading to a delay for every automotive manufacturer across the world. So it's not just India that is being affected, everybody else around the world is also being affected by the same, by, by these same two challenges. And these challenges also, let me tell you, are not going to go away anytime too soon. These challenges are here to stay. They will be here for, I mean, if I could safely put a bet on it, I would say for the next four or five years, if not longer. Um, all right. But here's a question from Mangesh. Uh, he's saying, electric future aside, why do manufacturers launch models with naturally aspirated engines? Why not just turbocharged ones? Well, naturally aspirated engines are the cheaper engines, uh, Mangesh. That's one of the only reasons why they still go with naturally aspiration, natural aspiration rather than turbocharging. When you do turbocharging, uh, it, it, it increases the cost of that engine, that, that particular engine. So while yes, it is lower capacity engine, you have better efficiencies, the cost, however, goes up considerably because the engine has to be designed in that manner, the turbocharger has to be designed in that manner uh, to deliver that kind of output, power output for a smaller unit. So all of these factors increases cost, and that's the only reason why there are still naturally aspirated engines out in the market today. All right. Um, Dilip wants to know why are EVs receiving so much criticism when it comes to long distance trips, waiting lines and long charging times? Did you guys hear any answer for the, uh, for this from any of the car companies? Well, it's not EVs that are receiving uh, criticism, Dilip, uh, that, uh, you know, when it comes to long distance trips. But what you what you say is right. 
uh, we cannot rely on an ecosystem that only caters to you know urban commuting. Uh, a lot of people also travel in between cities, Bombay to Pune, Bombay to Lunavla, Bombay to uh, you know Surat, Wapi. Uh, just as an example, Delhi to Gurgaon, for instance. Let me take let me take that. There are lakhs and lakhs of commuters who travel from Greater Noida all the way up to Delhi, maybe even further up to Gurgaon for that matter for their jobs. Uh, so that sort of commute is not easily achievable with an electric vehicle because you'll be charging almost every single day. Uh, and for this, you need uh, you need an array. You need you need hundreds, not hundreds, I'd say thousands of fast charging stations across that particular city, uh, across our highways, to kind of facilitate or to make sure that mobility isn't affected. Uh, you know, when you're uh, when you're traveling in between cities. Now, when you're going just doing these long distance trips, now what essentially is happening also, and what you see, while there may be a network in some places, in some regions would have a network, these charging stations, they're just one or two charging stations at that location. And it's quite possible that there will be other electric vehicles charging over there. Now, charging times for any car, let's keep in mind, is not for an electric vehicle, is not very, very fast right now. Most of the fast chargers are what we call DC chargers. Uh, on an average, we're looking at about anywhere about, about on an average, you're looking about 30 kilowatt uh, hour chargers, and that's not very fast uh, charging. 30 kilowatt chargers, they're not very fast charging capacities. 30 kilowatts in the DC will still take, let's assume, uh, if you just do simple math, a 30 kilowatt hour battery would take about an hour to charge. Okay, uh, so in that sense, if you've got larger cars, bigger battery packs, need more charge for that matter it's also going to take you much much longer so you cannot say so if, if you have to say you know quick charging can i just put it up five minutes and get a charge yes you get a charge but probably five percent ten percent would be enough for you to complete your journey i don't know right so that's why you're seeing long waiting lines or you know long charging times that's inevitable until unless you go 60 kilowatt plus uh, you will not get faster charging you need to be we need to have a, or rather adopt a standard of at least 150 kilowatt across the country we need to have an array and this is this is studied information. Uh, most of the reports that have happened, that uh, that have you know studied uh, EV usage across the globe, uh, for that matter, all suggest that you need uh, 150 kilowatt uh, uh, charging stations uh, at least in a radius of about 25 kilometers from each other. So that's the only way that you can sustain uh, any long distance or even short distance driving when you know uh, electric vehicles reach uh, a, a much larger scales then yes, what you need is much, much larger, much more denser charging network across the country. All right, I guess uh, Rohit has managed uh, to join us. You can just get Rohit on the show as well. Hi, Soini. Hi, Bert. Hello, everyone. Hi, Rohit. Sorry Hi, for Rohit. the delay. Uh, I was dropping off a motorcycle and Pune traffic situation right now is terrible. Sorry about that. So, yeah, Actually, I'm back at my okay. desk. As long as you're here and you're ready to take the Citroen question. The C3, the C3 question. questions, yes. Yes, firstly, I, I think uh, you have mentioned this in the longer review. We just, uh, you know, had to chop it down a little bit for the digital show. Mm -hmm. But Mayur wanted to know what, how, how was the AC in the C3? Um, and what about the reliability of Citro products globally? Rohit, uh, is Rohit frozen? I think so. I think there's a net. Is there an issue of net network issue at your end, also, Swani? Because I am consistently seeing a lag. Yes. Yes. Even even so at, I, with your yeah yeah. Geo geo. Okay. Geo, Rohit, yeah. Rohit Rohit is frozen. <laughs> Not just geo. I all of our internet. Okay. He'll. I think he'll have to rejoin. Re-log in. He'll have to re-log in. So we give him a couple of minutes. But I saw a couple of what? questions. Uh, but there was one question from Zishan whether Ford is going to make a comeback to India. No, Ford is not going to make a comeback to India. Not nothing. Not anytime soon. At this point in time, they have uh, they're not even going back going ahead with their electrification plans. However, they do have their CBU plans, and which means there will be certain cars from the CBU range that will come down to India. Remember, we talked about uh, the Ford Raptor coming in, and then the Ford. Uh, there were two cars as well. The two other cars that are coming. Uh, I think the, the Mustang Mark E and something else. The three products, the four products they've got lined up for India. The Focus RS, uh, that is one of them. And there was something else also, if I'm mistaken. Maybe at some time, some point in time, they might come down to Bronco as well. But uh, anyway, the uh, point is that Ford is not coming back to India anytime soon. Right now, all they're uh, doing is kind of consolidating their business and making sure that things that are there right in place in India right now are running smoothly. 
and that uh, they are ready then to well, announce or at least go forward with their CBU plans for the Indian market. But are they going to exit? Then we don't know. We, at this point in time, nobody is really sure if or what is going to be happening and what will happen at Ford India. Uh, we can only cross our fingers and hope that they're still around and they're there uh, to conduct business in this market. Uh, I think it would be a great uh, thing if Ford could stay here um, and continue to service the Indian market. What is really cool is I also read an article just today. The Great Place to Work Institute has uh, released uh, this list of best places to work. And Ford India ranks uh, in the top 10. In fact, three, number three, as the best yeah, place to work. Have in more to do. <laughs> no, but it's, it's pretty cool. They must have done some research. But Rohit, Rohit is back. Rohit, if you could take the question about the AC before yes, your the AC. <laughs> Yes, so that was electricity. Sorry, load shedding oh. and whatever. Anyway, so uh, yeah, the air conditioning, uh, as mentioned in the full review, which is already showing on uh, the Overdrive YouTube channel, uh, the AC is surprisingly good. Uh, you know, it's quite powerful. Uh, what they have not done right, however, is that they haven't given rear AC vents, which means that, uh, you know, for the rear occupants to feel pleasant in the cabin, you usually have to keep the AC blower speed at a minimum of two. And that makes it quite noisy. The AC vents are quite big. The blows are quite big. And it is, uh, you know, pretty noisy inside the cabin as far as the blows are concerned. But the cooling efficiency, otherwise, if you are able to keep it at a higher blower speed, is actually very good. So I'm quite impressed uh, with the AC performance. And we did uh, drive the car over a few inclines as well with about three people in the car and some luggage. Not a lot of luggage, but some luggage. And uh, even with the AC running, uh, there wasn't much of a problem. Of course, all modern uh, AC systems, uh, you know, they they do sort of uh, switch off for a little bit uh, if there is load on the engine. Uh, but, uh, you know, we did not feel that happening too often. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the way they've tuned the AC for the Indian conditions. And uh, let me remind you, when we were shooting this car, this was really hot and humid in Goa at that point of time. And usually in humid with weather, ACs don't really uh, function all that well. Uh, but this one did an exceptionally good job. So I'm pretty impressed with how they've tuned that AC. Uh, Rohit Zishan wanted to know, Citro is a great company. However, suspension setup would matter a lot as uh, ma majorly this car could be a hit in metro cities and tier 2 cities. But he says that the roads in tier 2 cities are not very good. Correct. So as I mentioned in the review again, uh, it doesn't run any fancy setup the way the C5 does, right? Uh, but uh, at the same time, even with uh, the low cost setup that they have, uh, they've tuned it quite nicely. And I have I have literally, uh, you know, even uh, shown it in the review uh, where we tried to replicate that uh, egg basket test, uh, you know, so uh, all the all the 12 eggs were absolutely fine. There was absolutely no problem there, nothing cracked. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed with how they've managed to tune that suspension as well. Uh, which is why I kept harping about the right quality in that car because that is the signature of a Citroën product, right? Apart from a flamboyant design, of course, uh, which can be polarizing at times, but the suspension, the right quality is really good. So you'll have to drive it to believe it, probably. Uh, so definitely do take a test drive. Uh, you know, of, uh, even if you're not uh, planning to buy the car, I think you should definitely take a test drive of the car just to see how well they have tuned that suspension for this particular price bracket. Ruth, what do you think is uh, the price going to be? Well, that is going to be a tricky one. Uh, my expectation, my hope is that, uh, you know, they price it uh, a little above or around that Celerio mark, uh, not uh, not go overboard because as we've seen, even on the range topping trim, uh, you know, you don't have a, have a big features list. They have cut costs wherever they could. So I hope that they are able to get a kick-ass pricing uh, you know, even for the top end trim, not just an entry price, but even for the top end trim. So if they're able to sort of get around that Celerio price point and then give you a product uh, or a car as roomy and large as this, uh, then it could certainly be a game changer. If it's only marginally cheaper than, say, an Ignis or a Bellino or a Swift, then they might lose the plot because there the, the whole, uh, you know, uh, Maruti ecosystem will just win and uh, it will not let this product survive at all. All right. Um, there was one more question about. Uh, the body roll bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is kind of.
kind of an opinion. He says uh, C three has huge body roll, so many features absent, fewer service networks, not that impressive styling. I don't see C three working out in India, Prince Wabi's. What do you think, uh, Rohit? Uh, I agree with a few pointers, not with all of them. Uh, again, it's a new uh, brand that has entered India, unlike uh, say an MG, which already had uh, you know uh, the know-how of the Indian market. Or unlike a Kia, which again had know-how thanks to Hyundai, uh, this is a this is a fresh brand in the Indian market, right? They've only sort of uh, started establishing dealerships last year, and we have to remember that uh, you know they came in with all guns blazing, and then the whole pandemic happened. So obviously, uh, the plans did not execute as per uh, their uh, projection would have been. However, I think uh, now they are looking at expanding quite rapidly. Uh, in fact, by the end of this year, they are looking at having 30 sales points. Uh, within the country, uh, of course, sustainability has been a very big uh, talking point for them. They want to expand their business in a sustainable model. Uh, they don't want to uh, go all out with you know opening tons and tons of dealerships and then not being able to sustain all of that. So sustainability is obviously going to be important. So tier one, tier two, tier, uh, two cities is something that they are going to be targeting. They'll probably look at tier three cities a little later. Uh, and in terms of that body role, uh, I would not use the word huge there. It's not a huge body role. Uh, like I've mentioned in my uh, review as well, that uh, you know the body roll is more than something like uh, something that sits more squat like a Bellino or a Swift, but it's comparable to something like a Punch or a Renault Kaiga, and uh, that essentially should tell you it's not a huge body roll. And that amount of body roll is something that I'm ready to live with for the kind of ride quality that the car offers in this price bracket, right? So it's always going to be a give and take. Of course, there are examples uh, uh, which are uh, you know which will be different than what I'm saying, but usually when you mm -hmm. have a soft ride, a supple ride. There is a bit of body roll involved as well, and that is exactly what the C3 has. But nothing is unnerving; it never gets unnerving, uh, you know. So it's not a matter of worry for me. Uh, so, as far as the features go, my uh, my genuine feedback to uh, Citroen has been that there ought to have been a third variant, a third variant which has some of the optional accessories as a standard fit, like the the reversing camera or the alloy wheels. Uh, or even isofix style seat mounts, which are not an optional accessory, but these ought to have been there at least as a range topping variant. Uh, but again, uh, Citroën tells me that they have access to all of this and they can add all of this to the C3 uh, if the market really demands it. So I think the strategy right now is going with this product, going with a very good pricing to attract people to the dealerships to begin with. And once that happens, of course, they can expand on the number of trim levels. Uh, also remember, the C3 Aircross is the next vehicle which comes out next year which is essentially this car with probably a little bit more ground clearance, uh, a little bit more uh, hefty styling uh, to go against the Kyger uh, and even the sub 4 meter uh, crossover. So it's obviously slightly smaller than the, the typical sub 4 meter uh, crossovers, but it essentially wants to sort of rival those as well. So that would be the C3 Aircross. And I'm guessing that will allow them to, uh, you know, it will give it a little bit more room, a little higher ceiling in terms of the pricing. And that will allow them to put in more features so that there's a clear differentiation between the C3 hatch and the C3 aircross. Okay, we'll quickly take two more questions about the C3 and then we'll jump into news because there's a lot uh, we still have. Rohit, uh, Manish wants to know, uh, is the C3 is build quality more like a Japanese uh, car or European like the Volkswagen? Uh, it is somewhere in between. It's somewhere in between. It's not as uh, clunky, let's put it that way, as the, uh, the low-cost Japanese products. At the same time, it is not as polished as a, a VW or even Citroën's own, uh, you know, C5 kind of products or even the other products that we have seen internationally. Uh, you know that these are low-end materials that have been used, but they have been very nicely put together. There are no awkward uh, panel gaps here and there to, or inconsistent panel gaps to complain of. There are no flimsy bits here and there uh, to, you know, uh, complain of. So, yeah, it is low-end materials, but quite nicely put together. So, it's somewhere in between the Japanese quality and the European quality. The price point is the important bit here. But here's a question for you. Uh, Dilip wants to know, is the Mahindra Scorpio uh, XUV700 minus the ADAS features? Well, I don't know, but um, it's definitely a minus XUV700. Uh, it's a large vehicle though, nonetheless. And I think there's significant design changes that will kind of uh, identify this as a much larger vehicle also than the previous generation Scorpio. It looked like that, please. Uh, will it, um, you know, have or rather not have the ADAS features? I'm not entirely sure because keep in mind Mahindra and Tata Motors 
are very gungwa, very, very uh, strong position where safety is concerned and that's one of the biggest um, well uh, that, that's one of the routes that they're going down with so it's quite possible that they might have ADAS as well on this maybe not on the lower end maybe at the top end uh, keep in mind one of the competitors for the Scorpio is the uh, Aster the MG Aster and the MG Aster offers you ADAS at this point in time uh, and the Scorpio will be positioned somewhere I'm assuming uh, close to um, or somewhere in the same region as where the Creta the Aster the Celtos are uh, at this point in time. So it's quite likely that you might get some of those uh, well top class features, safety features uh, in it. But let's see, it's not too far away. We're going to be driving the car towards the end of the month uh, and we will have a review for you very, very soon. Rohit, can we say the C3 uh, will compete against uh, the Quid Climbo? No, certainly not. 2.5 meter long wheelbase. It is a much bigger vehicle than the Quid. It is a bigger vehicle than the Celerio. It is a bigger <laughs> vehicle than the Espresso. So these are not idealist competitors. Uh, you're looking at a, an Ignis competitor here. It's almost comparable in size to the Renault Kaiga and the Nissan Magnite. Uh, just that they don't want to call it an SUV or a crossover. Uh, that will be the C3 Aircross, which comes out next year. Okay. We'll... Uh... Run through our news, There's, uh, there are quite a few videos that we have to play as well. So let's start with the hottest launch from this week, the facelifted venue starting at 7.53 lakh rupees for the 1.2 litre petrol. The 1 litre turbocharged petrol and the 1.5 litre diesel has been priced at 9.99 lakh rupees ex showroom. Toin brings us details from the launch floor. The Hyundai venue may be a popular compact SUV, but an increasing number of rivals has made it harder to make an impression on buyers. So this facelift comes just in time to keep you interested. And today we're going to see what exactly has changed with this 2022 Hyundai Venue. So with this facelift, the Venue now moves to the latest Hyundai design themes that you've seen on SUVs like the Tucson. So as you can see, there's this new segmented grille finished in this dark sort of chrome kind of trim, which now merges with these uh, the top half of the uh, headlamp. The headlamps themselves are now LED projectors, which means that you have this empty sort of wide bar in the front where the earlier sort of segmented arrangement used to be like. Now you get this new fiery red shade and in this dual tone color. But aside from that in profile, not much has changed with the facelifted venue. You get a new design for the 16 inch alloy wheels and you get puddle lamps here, which weren't there before. Now the most striking change is possibly to the rear of the new venue where you can see it gets this very smart looking full width LED light bar which is again in an H pattern very similar to the latest Tucson which is coming to India soon. And as you can see the tail lamps have been completely redesigned, they get this kind of segmented sort of design like the Ionic 5 very vaguely which means that below it again from the front you have that wide sort of bumper design with these segments to again sort of enhance the width of the car. Now there are some noticeable changes on the inside of the new venue as well. As you can see there's a new colour scheme, it's a grey and sort of beige colour scheme. And you also get a quite a few more features. To start with you get this new 4 spoke steering wheel from the Creta. You have an LCD display quite similar to the, ones, uh, to the one that we saw on the Kia Carens. And there's quite a few more features. For example this 8 uh, inch touchscreen which will support wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. It now has over 60 connected tech features, including Google and Alexa integration, car to home. And you also get a sound of nature in which will play soothing background noises. Then you get these uh, four-way adjustable powered uh, driver seats, which is a segment first. And of course, the usual features continue, like you have wireless charging, this auto climate control, the sunroof. Another new feature is this uh, ambient lighting that you get over here in the cabin, which wasn't there earlier. And the air purifier, as you can see, is still here, but it's now been integrated into this armrest. Same for the wireless charger. Now, in terms of safety equipment, the venue gets six airbags, hill descent control and TPMS. TPMS is standard across the range, by the way. Now, Hyundai has tried its best to increase space in the rear seat and it's done it smartly. For example, it's scooped out the seat back here, which means that you get just a touch bit more knee room. But the more significant change and another segment first is you get a two-step reclinable backrest, which, has done, which as you can see works like this. 
Now the venue remains mechanically unchanged with this facelift, which means it gets the 1.2 liter naturally aspirated petrol as the base engine. It gets the 1 liter turbo petrol as well as this, the 1.5 liter turbo diesel. Of course, you have all manner of transmission options to go with these uh, engines, which are again quite similar to what was offered earlier. Prices for the Hyundai when you started to be 7.53 lakh for the NA petrol, while the turbo petrol and the diesel both started roughly 10 lakh rupees. What do you think about the venue? Do you think it's the best compact SUV right now? Let us know in the comments. All right, we're also days away from reviewing the Mahindra Scorpio N-Line variant. But just earlier this week, an owner's handbook was leaked, which has given us an idea of the SUV's dimensions. The new Mahindra Scorpio N will be 4,662mm long and 1,870mm tall. At 1,917mm, it will be 17, uh, it will be 97mm wider than the current Scorpio and will feature an extended wheelbase. The Scorpio's, uh, Scorpio N's wheelbase is 70 millimeter longer than the Scorpio Classic and it's approximately 206 millimeter longer than the current model. This translates to greater space in the second row and more legroom for the third row passengers who will also benefit from the front facing seats. When compared to the Tata Safari, the Scorpio N promises to be slightly larger. Now also ahead of its global debut on 27th of July, images of the whole cabin layout and dashboard has been shared. The premium Sony 3D sound system from the XUV700 will be carried forward into this model as well. And the primary infotainment will also be powered by the Adrenox. Seats get a dual tone black and brown color scheme. Vertical AC vents adorn the dash. And there is an all digital driver display with mounted controls behind the steering wheel. From the images that were shared, the cabin looks quite premium. There's something that we missed last week. Only two Mercedes AMG GD Black Series cars have made it down to India. And the first ever AMG GD Black Series was de uh, delivered just last week to Bengaluru's Bupesh Reddy at a whopping 5.5 crore rupees ex showroom Delhi. What makes this AMG exclusive is that it holds the record of being the fastest series production car to ever lap Nürburgring's Nordsch Life circuit. How fast? It clocks 100 kmph in just 3.2 seconds, top speed of 325 kmph all thanks to the 4-litre V8 engine that makes 730 PS of max power and 800 newton meters of max torque. This is the most powerful Mercedes AMG ever built. Also earlier this week, Lamborghini India showcased the final edition of the Aventador Ultima, the last one to house a naturally aspirated V12. Tuin turned up in Delhi to pay his respects. Now this is what a farewell from Lamborghini looks like. It's the Lamborghini Aventador Ultima, the last Aventador to be made at the end of its 11 year production run. And it's also the last naturally aspirated V12 Lamborghini. So it's no surprise that this iteration of the 6.5 liter V12 is the most powerful that's ever been fitted to a standard production Lamborghini model. The motor now makes 780 PS and 720 Newton meters, which is 10 more than even the track-focused SVJ and 40 more than the standard Aventador S, which means that the Ultima can do 0 to 100 in 2.8 seconds, 0 to 200 in 8.7 seconds, and reach a 355 kmph top speed. Now, the Aventador's replacement will be a hybrid when it launches in 2024. And this is an especially significant change because a V12 in a Lamborghini predates even this exaggerated styling that you so associate this brand with. It dates back to the 350 GT, the first ever Lamborghini. Now, I've never really seen an Aventador at close quarters like this before. And the Roadster is really an event even when it's static like this. Now, for the Ultima, Lamborghini hasn't gone too far overboard by its standards. So aside from the already exaggerated cuts and creases, there isn't too much more that's been added to the car. It's very subtle. So for example, you have this front bumper, which has these sort of straight designs to it, with these highlights, which you can choose in various colors. And that extends through the car and right to the end at the diffuser too. And that's pretty much the only noticeable difference in the way the Ultima looks against another Aventador. Now, as with any other Aventador, the Ultima also gets a carbon fiber tub there's a lot of carbon fiber on the bodywork, like on the hood and on the roof. 
and you have this race inspired push rod suspension rear wheel steer and a robotized 7 speed single clutch automatic now unlike the svj and its fixed wing the ultima gets a three stage retractable spoiler and as you can see the back it's got these massive exhaust tips as big as probably my fist and a wide open diffuser below again with those highlighted streaks from the front Now changes to the inside of the Altima are as subtle as the ones on the outside. So you know that this is an Altima with these laser etched Y motifs inside. It's a largely carbon and alcantara interior. And specifically for this model you get a special plaque commemorating the fact that this is one of 600 such cars in the world. Now there will only be 350 coupe Altimas and 250 roadsters of which this is one. This is the only one coming to India and every Altima is now sold out. What a farewell. And finally some innovative news on electric batteries being repurposed and reused a joint venture between German and Indian startup Nunam which has offices in Berlin and Bangalore is setting uh, is sending three electric rickshaws to India powered by repurposed batteries from Audi e-tron's test fleet. to see how old high voltage battery modules may be given a second life following their automotive life cycle these e rickshaws will be given uh, to a non profit organization where women in particular will be able to utilize the electric rickshaws to transport their items to market for sale without the need for intermediaries in india experimental e rickshaws powered by used batteries are expected to hit the roads by early 2023 let's get rohit and bot on the show once again I I think both of you are on mute. Yeah. But you are on mute. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I had to switch off from my laptop and get onto my phone now because I think Streamyard or something is having an issue. I'm not able to see you guys clearly. But uh, I'm back again. And yeah, let's let's get into whatever is happening. So, any the hottest launch of the week isn't the venue. Well, hottest in the sense that you know you're going to get the maximum numbers as well. How many people are going to afford the Lamborghini? So, well, of course, well, the hottest well, car would be the Lamborghini. One, only one, as we know it, and that's why it becomes extremely hot. <laughs> <laughs> the yes, most important, be... one of the most important in this week, yes, absolutely, the venue. But I think the hottest was either the AMG or the Lamborghini. You guys out there can decide. Okay. Um. Here was a question from Mayul. Do you guys have any idea about the launch of the Mercedes AMG One? When is it launching in India? Well, again, it will take some time uh, for the AMG One to come to India as well. But more than that, more important than that is the fact that uh, it will come in extreme. If it comes to India, also it may just be that one or the two will kind of buy the AMG One. Keep in mind, uh, even the Black Series, there are two cars that are coming down to India. One of them was well. Location ready. We bought that car in Bangalore. Uh, there will be a series, second one as well. But uh, you know, for a car uh, as rare as the MG One, there will be probably fewer takers. Maybe one, maybe two. Who knows? Let's see. But it's it will take its time coming out to India. But Dilip wants to know why is Toyota giving the Hydra or all-wheel drive tech when uh, it is a petrol which will eventually drain the mileage? Uh, can we expect it to be up to date? car or is it going to be taken for granted with just high price well it will be an upgrade car okay that's for sure uh, all wheel drive will of course means that it is it intends to take or at least uh, you know get into that market into the market where the xv700 exists and take a few of those consumers away from it uh so in that sense all the time would uh, would work for uh, for that kind of a product just don't expect it to you know uh, go off road or anything of that sort what they probably would be looking at is uh, uh you know uh better dynamics but again let's let's just wait for the hardware to come out and we'll have more information about what exactly is the configuration what exactly is being offered in this car as well. all right we have a question here from uh, sorry it's just yeah um anju raj wants to know any update on the mg hector diesel automatic as mentioned by rajiv chaba last year uh 
Anjuraj, nothing as of yet. As we know, it, this year they're not going to have too many other launches uh, coming out of the market, and they're going to be a bit slow with what they're offering for now because again they're facing a lot of issues with uh, supply chains, uh, semiconductors, and they're not able to deliver cars in time. Uh, and until and unless that is sold out, they won't be focusing too much on getting new products out in the market, and on those will be vehicle diesel with the automatic transmission. Okay, I was just scrolling through if there are any more questions. Uh, okay, Aman wants to know, do you think the upcoming Lexus RX will have uh, a market considering it's a crossover body style and will be priced around the GLS and X7? Lexus anyways has a very small market share in India. Uh, but I mean, the fantastic cars will drive, absolutely brilliant. And I've enjoyed every single one of them. Uh, but yes, it will, it will continue to have a very, very small market. The numbers will not be that large in any case. Nowhere close to what Mercedes, Benz, or BMW, or even Audi is doing for that matter right now. Uh, but it's a great car. Uh, will it compete against GLS 7, X7? Uh, yes, it competes against them, but it certainly will not do those kind of numbers. Not that the GLS and the X7 are doing great numbers either, but uh, you know, the, and the, uh, the RX will have even lower volumes than that. But uh, that's essentially where it, uh, where it fit itself in. And anyone who buys a Lexus, I mean, uh, I haven't heard of any disgruntled owners as of yet. Everyone's quite happy with their cars. And uh, Lexus isn't out in this market to kind of do those kind of volumes in any case. So there you have it. Uh, I think Lexus will be happy enough with the kind of numbers that they will do with the RX or for that matter with any of the other cars. Okay, we'll take one last question. Uh, Rahul wants to know, what do we know, uh, know about the new Seltos? So, Rohit, you want to take that? Yeah, so the uh, so some spy videos were out uh, last week. I think that is where your question is coming from, Rahul. Uh, so what we know of the new Seltos so far, uh, well, there is a new Creta, an updated Creta coming, Creta N line as well. So there are new features, a lot more on the connected side of things, of course. And uh, those kind of similar things we'll also see in the new Seltos. So there will be updates to the styling, uh, the, the kind of styling that we are now seeing, the evo evolution of the PR design theme that you're seeing now with cars like the Currents or uh, uh, even uh, the new Sportage that was recently shown. So you will see that kind of an evolution happening with the Seltos as well. Uh, that Tiger nose, uh, that digital Tiger nose that uh, we saw on the Currents is something that will also uh, find uh, its way onto the new Seltos. There will be nips and tucks, of course. And uh, I'm guessing those will be significant nips and tucks. And I'm guessing, again, uh, that it will be launched around the Auto Expo. That's uh, early next year. Uh, first quarter of next year. That's what my info is so far. Actually, there's uh, one more bit of uh, news that came in uh, earlier today as well, that Ferrari has announced that they'll be launching 15 new products by 2026. That's quite a big number, right? And uh, we also know that the, uh, is it called the Pura Song, the SUV? Pura Song. Pura Song. Yeah, right? I not pronounce it as of yet. But yeah, that's, that's what it'll be. And alongside and that, they're also... also yeah. And they're also coming back yeah. to the mall. Yes. Oh, oh, so this is news as well. But yeah. uh, by 2025, they said that, you know, hybrids will account for 55% of Ferrari sales and uh, the battery electrics will account for 5%, which is uh, quite something. Um, so, yes, uh, that is that. Those are big plans because for Ferrari to do those that 15, 16 new cars coming out in the next three years, for that matter, that is that is huge. Uh, those are kind of volumes and scales that they're looking at. It. They never ever looked at it. Looked at in the past for that matter. I mean, that's literally at the rate of almost four, probably five new cars uh, every year. Every year. Uh, that is that is amazing. Ferrari's never gone, you know, that aggressive ever before. And we've been quite happy saying, we got one model and that's the only model you'll receive this year. But now, you know, having five new cars out every year almost, it's, it's going to be huge. And are we going to get most of the global portfolio in India as well? What do you all think? Yes, That's Ferrari true. has sure. uh, Ferrari has Ferrari's never uh, backed off by offering any. It's a, it's a on demand. So if a customer wants a particular car, they just place a place an order for it, and the car is delivered to them. Uh, but yeah, India is not the biggest market for them. If there is a market; it's a small market. Uh, and uh, again, everything will be made to order uh, when you want it. They will deliver it. Okay. Uh, we'll wrap up this week's show then, but uh, let's take a look at what we have on the television show tomorrow at 1 p.m. on CNBC TV 18. The Citroën C5 is an imported product, but Citroën's much awaited made in India, made for India car is this the C3.
Now this is what a farewell from Lamborghini looks like. It's the Lamborghini Aventador Ultima, the last Aventador to be made at the end of its 11 year production run. And it's also the last naturally aspirated V12 Lamborghini. We have to uh, accept that we are so f uh, so much at the beginning of the learning curve mm -hmm. that we really don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. you know. But what is important is the attitude of the company mm -hmm. to a problem. Well, as mentioned, the show will air tomorrow at 1 p.m. on CNBC TV 18. And, it'll, uh, and you can catch a repeat telecast on Sunday, 12.30 and 8 p.m. as well. So uh, is is this uh, one of the last shows we're doing for a while? Because I guess you guys are traveling uh, from next week, right? Uh, it's quite likely, guys, every now and then, uh, the next few weeks are going to be extremely hectic for the next three, four weeks are going to be pretty hectic. Uh, we've got some big stories lined up and uh, we'll be out filming those shooting that. Uh, we're also traveling, overseas travel also has opened up, so we will be overseas as well. And I'm not sure, uh, but if times match and if we are free at those times, then we certainly will get online and have a digital show for you. But uh, stay tuned to our uh, update, updates on social media, on Twitter and on, uh, on Instagram and Facebook. And do join us uh, as soon as you know that we have another live show coming out and uh, we'll be here to answer all queries. But yeah, the next few weeks, lots of work, lots of travel, lots of new cars. Uh, and motorcycles that we'll be driving and riding uh, globally. So, yeah. And, of course, one very important and interesting story coming up as well. Uh, and I think roughly about three weeks from now. So, stay tuned to our social media channels to get a lot more, to know more about what you're up to. So, even if we can't catch up on the digital show, we have our uh, usual television show every week. So, do catch up with us. Uh, at least watch the stories there as well. So, we'll catch up when we do next. See you guys. Have fun. Have a nice weekend.